Welcome back, Canaanites. There are a ton of awesome announcements this week, so let's get right to it. We open with an official announcement for an upcoming Halo anthology comic titled Halo Tales from Slipspace. Found via an Amazon listing a few days ago and now officially revealed, this graphic novel will feature stories from Frank O'Connor and Halo producer Tyler Jeffers, along with work from comic book names including John Jackson Miller, Simon Roy, Cody Chamberlain, Bill Senkowitz, Jonathan Wayshack, Alex Irvine, Vasilis Lolos, David Crossland, and Duffy Boudreau. Apologies for any mispronunciations. By the way, that last name may sound familiar. Mr. Boudreau took over writing for Halo Escalation after issue 10. While his short stories were superb, we all know what happened with the Janice Keen Absolute Record story arcs. Hopefully his work here won't be a repeat of those, but rather his better stuff. Also, just to note, some of those names are artists and others are writers. There's currently no word on how many stories we can expect. We do know, however, that the graphic novel should be around 96 pages, at least according to the Amazon listing. For reference, the graphic novel was 128 pages, but included a lot of bonus art and the first story was fairly long compared to the others. Given the title, Tales from Slipspace, speculation has been all over the place. Personally, I think the title is just a reference to Tales from the Crypt, but I've seen people hoping for stories from the early days of Slipspace travel, Great Team, and so much more. What do you guys think? At the end of the day, though, this has me super excited. Escalation, while having high points, was largely a letdown for myself and many fans. Hopefully, this can get Halo comics back to their roots and return them to glory. The current Amazon listing indicates that it should sell at $19.99 USD and will be released on October 12th. Before moving on, we have another piece of Halo print media to discuss. Also discovered via an Amazon listing, and quick special thanks to fan of the channel David Cortez, apologies if I mispronounced your last name, is a currently unnamed Halo novel. The listing doesn't have much info, only that the book is expected to sell at 16 USD, be 416 pages long, and should be released on September 20th. Don't latch onto that date too much until we've heard officially from 343 directly, as the previously discussed graphic novel had a release date of October 25th on Amazon, but obviously we've heard differently from 343. Subject-wise, there's very little we can glimpse at this point. However, both Matt Forbeck and Troy Denning have lately hinted that they may be working with 343 again, maybe being the key word. I'd love to see either of them return, as both have great writing styles that merge well with Halo. I'd personally love to see a story about Grey Team, since we had that recent cannon fodder blurb about active Spartan 2s using Mark IV, or perhaps a follow-up to Last Light if Mr. Denning specifically returns. Who wouldn't love to see what Team Saber and Veta Lopes have been up to following the events on Gao, or how any of the characters or factions in that book there's a lot to potentially follow up on. Interestingly, the current listing notes the book will be written by various authors, so it's possible we might be getting another Halo Evolution-style novel. Whatever the subject, I am excited. Now getting back to cannon fodder, our next several entries deal with new and existing ships coming to Halo Fleet Battles. First up is the Valiant Class Super Heavy Cruiser, a ship originally conceived as a battleship heavy cruiser hybrid of sorts. However, it would go through years of feasibility studies and redesigns before the first of its class was released from the Martian shipyards in 2493. While initially very promising, the Valiant quickly proved very costly and delays in incorporating next-gen fusion drives seemingly doomed the entire class. Less than two years after rollout, the class was stricken from UNSC naval roles and partially scrapped. However, following several instances of insurrection sympathizers infiltrating the Colonial Military Authority, aka the CMA, in 2497, the UNSC Navy found its responsibilities and prestige expanding, so the Valiant class was resurrected to compensate for lack of command and control vessels. These ships proved to have the tonnage to augment battlegroups of smaller vessels on patrol missions, as well as the space to install flag bridge facilities for admirals leading such expeditionary operations. The UNSC Valiant, the lead ship of the class, and a handful of other super heavy cruisers were converted into command ships. The most famous of these would be the UNSC Everest, a ship that fans should recognize as the flagship of Vice Admiral Preston Cole's fleet during his campaign against the Covenant. Sadly, between resource and crew shortages during Operation Trebuchet, an anti-insurrectionist operation, and the later war efforts against the Covenant, not all Valiant-class vessels were able to receive proper command suite upgrades. This is a great ship I'm happy to see coming to fleet battles, and once Phoenix-class vessels are added to the game, players will be that much closer to being able to reenact the Battle of Harvest. Next up is the infamous CPV-class Heavy Destroyer, which we should all recognize from Halo Wars. One of the most feared ship silhouettes among human forces, within the Covenant, these ships were often crewed by those deemed unstable or unsuitable for service in regular ministry fleets. Those who served had not committed actions that could be called heresy, but whom had been condemned for disloyalty and disobedience. 
CPVs were often assigned to the early stages of orbital bombardment at a time when the ground side defenses were still withering away and orbital defenses were still viable. Hundreds of these shattered hulls can be found on various charred worlds, the crews finding last moments of honor in these suicidal tasks that their family names might once again be added to the roles of those worthy of walking the path to salvation. If the Arbiter rank was how the Covenant handled particularly troublesome Sunghealy, CPVs would seem to be the solution for anyone else. As the war carried on, CPV crews had a newfound purpose as executioners and heralds, their ships' excavation beams carving sigils into cleansed worlds and eliminating remaining resistance forces unworthy of combat with a fleet's supreme commander. The crews also found they could gain honor by assisting artifact hunting fleets that scour human worlds for Forerunner relics and war trophies, many crews becoming sorts of quasi-mercenary bands, each eager to one-up each other by finding the most valuable treasures and trinkets. So that's fairly interesting, is it not? A very unique ship type with a very, very unique history within the Covenant. Up next we have the Punic-class supercarrier, a ship designed as a space control vehicle to fight a new style of colonial war in the final years of the 25th century. For context, prior to the insurrection of that era that went on into the 26th century, UNSC ship commanders weren't all that familiar with space combat and how to effectively use their weapons, namely the Max. It has been said that, in certain ways, the insurrection actually prepared the UNSC for their inevitable fight with the Covenant. The Punic class was a massive ship capable of transporting and sustaining entire CMA expeditionary and interdiction campaigns for months at a time, adept at crushing dissent and terrorism before it could spread too far. Unfortunately, the Covenant showed up. While the Punic class served well during the war, notably during the last stand above Etuary, and at Charybdis 9 as a base station for counterinsurgency and evacuation operations, they were few in number. The destruction of any one meant an irreplaceable loss of elite crew and materiel. By 2552, only a handful of these ships remained, including the Pride of Reach's local fleet, the UNSC Trafalgar. Finally, we have another infamous silhouette, the CAS-class Assault Carrier. These ships represented the deadly might of the Covenant, each carrier capable of laying waste to thousands of troops and fighter craft, its array of energy projectors able to burn entire continents. Of course, at its size and power, the ships were expensive to build, thus few in number, and the loss of only one would be mourned by the entire Covenant. Major Covenant fleets would often be accompanied by at least one assault carrier, if for no other reason than the CAS required a significant number of support vessels. While multiple assault carriers in a fleet was unusual, it wasn't unheard of, the most famous example being Regret's fleet of sacred consecration, which was led by Solemn Penance, Regret's personal carrier, and the Day of Jubilation. Damn, that is a lot of info. Some repeat, but a ton of very new and very enlightening stuff. Moving forward, the article closes this week with a couple of community questions. The first asks if there are other sapient lifeforms in the Milky Way. The short answer is yes. In Halo Salentium, it was revealed that at least 123 technologically capable species were indexed, and who knows how many species in general. Of course, of all the life in the Milky Way galaxy, only a fraction would go on to achieve even a Tier 7 or pre-industrial civilization, and only a handful of those would go on to be encountered by humanity. The Covenant, on the other hand, well, I think we're all fairly familiar, at least, with the concept of the Covenant Fringe. If not, this is a blanket term for species encountered by the Covenant, but never completely integrated like the species we're familiar with fighting. The second question asks whether Spartans during wargame simulations use their normal armor configuration or experiment with other armor sets. Simply put, the Spartan 4s, who already are given a great deal of freedom to adjust their armor configuration, even on a mission-by-mission -mission basis, often have favored kit that they use during wargames. Still, they are encouraged to try new and differing armor sets. With that, the article comes to a close, and we move on to the new universe entry this week, SOL7, aka Threshold. This gas giant should be familiar to every Halo fan as the planet that was formerly orbited by Installation 04 and home to a Forerunner gas mine that would later be used as a heretic outpost. Threshold was orbited by 12 moons, the largest of which was Basis. While not extensively surveyed, of Threshold's 11 other moons, at least two appear to either house a Forerunner installation or are entirely artificial. Current theories suggest that they provide maintenance for Alpha Halo. Currently, the gas giant is patrolled by a joint UNSC Sunghealy fleet, which maintains a 500 light second exclusion zone. Uncontrolled sentinels, volatile halo fragments, micro debris, malfunctioning forerunner artifacts, and the ever present danger of the flood make exploration of the area too dangerous. The one Wargames map based on Threshold is Colossus, Wargames map set 201 7, based on the mining facility once home to the heretic leader Sessa Refumi. 
The map was constructed based on scans from the UNSC Red Horse during its mission to the SOEL system in October of 2552, and corroboration from Sangheili later on. The final map is favored by fireteam leaders for objective-based combat sims. And that does it this week. Damn, that was a lot of new info, and I don't know about you, but it's left me extremely hyped. Thanks for watching as always, and until next time, this has been Halo Cannon. Hey guys, thanks for watching. If you liked this video, please consider giving it a thumbs up, subscribing, and sharing it around. You are the reason I get to keep doing this, so thank you, profusely thank you. If you want to dive deeper into Halo's lore, head over to the Halo Archive. It's a lore-based community that welcomes everyone from experts to rookies. No matter what your working knowledge, you'll be sure to find a friend and a good time.